Hi, this is Earth Science teacher Tim Martin, and in this astronomy video, I want to give you a brief introduction to the solar system and our planets. How many planets are there in the solar system? Well, to answer that question, we'll have to ask the question, what is a planet? And to answer that question, we'll have to go back in time. How good is your ancient Greek? Even if you're not familiar with ancient Greek, you may recognize a few of these letters, pi, lambda, alpha, nu, eta, tau, eta, sigma. That's planetes. That's where our modern word planets comes from. According to the ancient Greeks, these were the wandering objects in the sky. Unlike the stars, the planets moved from day to day across the sky. So, how many planets are there in the solar system? It helps if we understand another Romance language, but if we keep track of time, I'm sure you'll be familiar with many of these names. After all, the days of the week are named after, well, we have the Sun's Day, followed by the Moon's Day, and then Mars's Day, Mercury's Day, Jupiter's Day, Venus's Day, and, yes, Saturn's Day. All the days of the week are named after the objects that moved in the sky. How many planets are there in the solar system? Well, according to the ancients, there were seven. Once Copernicus came along in the 1600s, and he was able to explain that the Earth was actually a planet that went around the Sun, the Sun and the Moon were demoted from planet status, but the Earth was added, and that brought the planet count to six. Using his large telescope in 1781, William Herschel discovered the planet Uranus. This brought the count back up to seven. Herschel also became known as the first individual to discover a planet because all of the other planets were discovered by the ancients long before recorded history. By 1865, the number had changed significantly. I use this number because I once saw an astronomy text from this year. And in that textbook, the planet count was listed at 83. Of course, now we know scientists were discovering many objects in the asteroid belt. Once we realized that many of these were quite small, the number in the early 20th century had dropped down to eight. So let's talk just a little bit about the discovery of that eighth planet. That was the discovery of Neptune. Scientists carefully measured the position of Uranus and realized there were some inconsistencies in its orbit. As Uranus was orbiting the Sun, there were some times when it appeared to be going faster than it was expected. Other times it appeared to be going slower. What could cause this? Well, a few scientists predicted that maybe there was another object deeper in space whose gravitational pull was causing Uranus to speed up and slow down in its orbit. It was Urbain Le Verrier who used mathematics to predict the location of this more distant object. Le Verrier contacted Johann Gottfried Galle, who in 1846 turned his telescope to the location predicted and within a very short time discovered Neptune. So it's worth noting that Neptune was predicted to exist by mathematics before it was actually observed to exist. Years later, similar observations of Neptune led some scientists to believe that there may be an object beyond Neptune. It was an American astronomer named Clyde Tumbaugh working at the Lowell Observatory who was searching for this object beyond Neptune. In the process of this search, Tumbaugh discovered Pluto. Pluto was not the object that was thought to be perturbing Neptune's orbit. In fact, those were simply errors in measurements of Neptune's orbit. The discovery of Pluto in 1930 was quite exciting, and it had dramatic impact in American popular culture. Walt Disney, who wanted to have a new pet for his cartoon mouse, named that new pet Pluto. That's right, the cartoon dog was named after the recently discovered American planet. On into the 1960s, another astronomer by the name of Gerard Kuiper predicted that there were many objects out beyond the orbit of Neptune. This area became known as the Kuiper Belt. As more objects were being discovered out in the Kuiper Belt, many scientists questioned, would we really keep nine planets in the solar system? What if we discovered something out there that was larger? Or what if we discovered things of similar size to Pluto? That finally happened in 2005 when Mike Brown, working at the University of Hawaii, discovered Eris. Eris, in fact, is heavier than the planet Pluto. 
So with the discovery of Eris, should we now have 10 planets in the solar system? Mike Brown and many other astronomers did not want to grant Eris planet status. In fact, they questioned whether or not Pluto fit the category because it was so small. The problem was there was no official definition for what a planet was. It was not until 2006, at a meeting of the International Astronomical Union, that we finally developed a definition for the word planet. So, what is the 2006 definition for planets? A planet is a celestial body that is in orbit of the sun, has sufficient mass for a self-gravity to overcome rigid body forces so that it assumes hydrostatic equilibrium and has cleared the neighborhood around its orbit. They went on to describe dwarf planets and also small solar system bodies. But this definition is a little bit of a mouthful, so can we simplify it? Well, it's not too difficult. Does the object orbit the sun? Does it have enough mass to be round? Does it have enough gravity to clear its orbit of other bodies? If you can answer yes to all of those questions, the object will be considered a planet. With this 2006 definition, we can now confidently say there are eight planets in our solar system. This definition is also important because in the last several decades, astronomers have been discovering numerous planets beyond our solar system. The discovery of these planets beyond our solar system and images taken by new telescopes have helped us understand something about planetary formation. In this NASA painting, we see a newly formed sun with a ring of debris orbiting around it. Inside this ring of debris, there are planetesimals. Small rocks and bits of gas and dust collide together. When they get large enough, they become protoplanets, and when protoplanets collide with other planetesimals and gradually accrete more material, they evolve into the objects that we know of as planets. As it turns out, when we look back at our own solar system, there are groups of several planets. The warmer, rockier bodies orbit closer to the central star, and further out are the gassy and icy objects. Let's take a look at these groups. The first group is a group of four terrestrial planets. These are the planets that have rigid surfaces, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. These four images are scaled proportionately, so Mercury is quite a bit smaller, and Earth is the largest of these four. Beyond the orbit of Mars is another group of over a thousand objects. This debris we know of as the asteroid belt. It never coalesced to become a major planet. Objects like Ceres are nearly a thousand kilometers in diameter. However, Itakawa in the upper left is merely 500 meters across. Beyond the asteroid belt is where we find the larger gas and ice planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. You can see the Earth to scale for comparison. Jupiter is more than 11 times the diameter of Earth. Jupiter and Saturn are made out of mostly gases, and Uranus and Neptune are a combination of gases and ices. Beyond the orbit of Neptune is where we find the Kuiper Belt, another area of debris. It's here where we find Pluto and Charon, the dwarf planet and its moon. Ultima Thule, both of these objects were recently visited by the New Horizons space mission. Out in the Kuiper Belt is where we'll find Eris. This is also the realm where many comets come from. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again on one of the other videos that goes into more detail about the terrestrial planets and the Jovian planets.